I will start today, uh, as I do most of the time, um, just to let you know I'm starting a, a, a collaborative in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, called the uh, Racial Empowerment Collaborative. And part of the idea is thinking about ways in which young people um, and families can um, address racial conflicts in a much more direct way, thinking about how to talk about these issues, um, how to think and feel about these issues. Uh, and so uh, one of the, we have two projects that we're about to start. One is um, loosely called Embrace Right Now, around teaching parents to talk to their kids about race and sort of what are the components of those aspects. And some of that's based on my work for about two and a half decades on racial socialization, where we found um, that parents talking to their kids about race has some positive outcomes, particularly with respect to managing anger, dealing with depression, uh, and also um, speaking up. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. So we're actually in the process of recruiting, doing some testing around what are the sort of ways in which parents uh, struggle through um, and successfully talk to children at different ages around race, because different ages matter. And then another project, which, um, uh, and I have two postdocs who are working on this currently, both of these projects, uh, called uh, Reflections, which is, some of you know, the Highlights magazine for children. Um, we're doing a version um, around racial trauma, and in the different places that I go around the country, uh, and talk to young people who have uh, stories to tell. Uh, we're going to use the magazine as a way to help them process their experiences, but also have a place to talk about them. But there'll be like a teacher's guide uh, and a parent's guide and a teenager's version um, since, since it's focused on younger kids to begin with um, as sort of, the, sort of the backdrop. And I had a, a wonderful time talking to the high schoolers today who um, graciously um, shared uh, information and, and, and talked uh, openly, I felt, about their experiences, or more so in the kinds of exercises I'm going to run through with some of you today. Uh, some of this starts with a certain set of beliefs around race and racial politics that I think challenges or tries to challenge how we often consider conversations about race. One uh, of them has to be around this notion of ideology. And that um, if we look at the kinds of experiences that have been happening with police and young people over the last um, several decades, but particularly media focused in the last uh, several years, I would argue that ideology has less to do with how those events occurred and more about what people do when they're scared and stressed and threatened in 60 seconds. And so a 60-second reality is different than an ideological sort of frame in which people tend to believe that my beliefs, my commitments in terms of voting, my commitments in terms of where I choose to go to school, who I want my children to be around, who my friends are, that those issues are very important and they're obviously linked to choices that we make. Um, but it's not always clear what people do when they're frightened or scared or feel threatened. And so in many respects, I like the frame of stress as opposed to ideology as a way to understand racial politics. Even though we have uh, national conversations or lack of conversations around um, where, where do you stand on certain issues. So uh, with that, I tell a story that I tell, which all my students and postdocs are sick, and hear, sick of hearing at this point in time. Oops. Somebody trying to slip in through the yep. side door. Okay. <laughs> Didn't work. Yeah. Um, about uh, growing up in, in a multicultural family. And both my parents were African American, but my mother was from North Philadelphia, and my father was from Southern Delaware. And Delaware is as different from Philly as East is from West, at least this part of Delaware. Anybody heard of Delaware? <laughs> OK. <laughs> I was telling the high school students, hello, today, uh, when I was in California going to graduate school, there were people who had asked me, what state is that in? <laughs> or is it the capital of Pennsylvania? Very silly stuff. 
you know, many years ago. Uh, so I always ask that people know. Anybody live from, from Delaware? Anybody here from Delaware? Okay, so uh, that's also of, often what happens. Uh, anybody ever drive through Delaware? And, <laughs> and you kept on moving probably? Yes. Yeah? Anybody? And what part of Delaware did you go through? Do you remember? Wilmington. I-95, <laughs> usually it's northern Delaware. There are two types of Delaware. There's a, there's a northern Delaware and a lower Delaware. And the northern Delawareans often talk about us in lower Delaware as slower Delawareans. Yes, and it's, it is uh, cultural. There's a very different language structure. There, um, and anthropologists have even come to southern Delaware to, to identify the speaking and ways in which folks in southern Delaware speak is very different. When we won, uh, in high school, I was on a basketball team um, that won the state championship uh, two years, my senior and junior year. And, and when we won it the first year, you would have thought we had won the Civil War <laughs> in Delaware because of the way that people in southern Delaware would come out to the banquets and, and just say thank you, you know, for beating those northern Delawareans. They, <laughs> and these were people who wouldn't speak to us regularly, but the fact that we won meant that we beat the northerners. And that's how country we were in southern Delaware. It's like Mississippi. And I was telling people today that I've been in Mississippi working with civil rights workers around racial trauma in the process. And um, having been in Mississippi, Delaware is a lot like it. Not only around the, the, the language, but politics. But how, how do you treat people in a very short uh, space? And so Delaware is a unique place in that regard. I grew up in a community, um, which is my father's community, of very church people. He had us in church would seem like seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And, and the ways in which people in Southern Delaware approach us around education was around, you've got to be careful that you get too much education because it will clog up your mind in a way that you'll forget who we are and where you came from. And so that was sort of socialized into our heads. And I am the oldest of three. My brother Brian is a famous lawyer. He wrote a book called Just Mercy. Um, and is actually going to be a movie made of it um, pretty soon. Um, and he's, as a lawyer, has been doing defense work around capital punishment for over 20 years. Um, and in the process of learning in Southern Delaware, he tells a story about never having seen a lawyer, never having seen a psychologist, being in a community of people who, who didn't always go to school but were very wise in how they raised us. But they all felt like they owned us, too, as family. So there's not a lot we could do without our parents finding out about it and getting back home uh, in the process. So church people concerned about our education would warn us of too much education. And so um, this one time, and people that I grew up with also don't care how many degrees I have. And when I go back now, they don't, they don't really get what it means to be a chair of an applied psychology department or a professor, and some will even ask, ain't you out of school yet? When you're getting out of school, <laughs> we don't understand that. I don't know if any of you come from communities that don't get academia. It's a very weird reality. Um, so I, I was telling today that um, uh, I was going to do some work for my father. I went to, to Acme Supermarket in Georgetown, Delaware, to buy some stuff for my father. And in the process, I was being busy uh, as I often am, and I was neglectful of the people in the store. And Mrs. Warrington, who's the praying lady of our church growing up, and many of you who might go to church or heard of church um, know that in some black churches, everybody prays, but there's usually one person who prays better than everybody. And <laughs> somehow they are able to call thunder and lightning from the sky and bring God quicker or something. But she was that lady, very quiet every day until she prayed, very loud. And so I was busy getting my father's food. I didn't see her in the store. And she got upset, called my father. And before I got home, she had told him that there was something wrong, hobby, with your boy. And uh, he said, what happened? He said, well, she, he came by me, and he didn't speak by me. He, he didn't speak to me when he walked by. So when I got in the house, my father said, what's wrong with you? And I said, what are you talking about? He said, you didn't speak to Ms. Warrington. 
And I said, oh, I didn't see it. Said, so I had to call Ms. Warrington and to say, Ms. Warrington, I'm so sorry. <laughs> You're absolutely right. There is something wrong with me. <laughs> I, didn't, I was being too busy, and I didn't speak. So I had to spend at least five minutes talking to Ms. Warrington about how her day is, how her life is. Uh, that's the community of Southern Delaware, and it's still that way. My father, who's still alive, um, is actually going to have surgery tomorrow uh, for cataracts. Uh, he's still there, and uh, the community hasn't changed. Now contrast that as a way of living with my mother, who's from North Philly. So my father, dealing with racial conflict, was around, uh, you pray for people. You know, Martin Luther King, so you pray for people when they mistreat you with the idea that God will get them in the end, right? We're never sure when the end is going to be, but you just still pray that God takes care of it. It's not your job to manage that. My mother in North Philly was much more in your face. She was used to being in segregated neighborhoods in which she was chased out of those neighborhoods because she didn't belong, and she chased people out of her neighborhood. So it was running and chasing. It was equal opportunity running and chasing. Her way is that she didn't let things slide. It was very hard for her when drama was about to blow up for her to be very direct about it. So growing up in this household was often confusing. So we talked about, um, and my brother will also t talk about this too, that going to the supermarket was a very stressful experience in Georgetown. And Georgetown was that, that place in which um, people were very, very bold about how they expressed their dissatisfaction about you. And it was often nonverbal. And anthropologists talk about nonverbal communication as some of the most uh, powerful communication, maybe more so. 70% of our communication might be nonverbal. So as children, we spent a lot of time watching what people did. And my mother created the most stir because her, of her way. She was a, an, an imposing person by her style and her mannerisms. Black people in Southern Delaware were very different from my mother. Uh, they would give way in the presence of whites. They would keep their head down. They would not look in the eye. And my mother just wouldn't have any of that. She wasn't deferential to anybody. She didn't give way to anybody. So when we go into the store, she'd have a way in which she walked that bothered people. She'd go, her, she'd go somewhere. She wanted to go there. She didn't need to ask anybody. And it was our job as children to keep up with her. We couldn't be late. So we had to keep our little legs moving. If she was moving, we had to be moving. And before we get in the store, she'd say, don't ask for nothing. Don't touch nothing. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? <laughs> I don't care if all the other kids are climbing the walls. They're not my child. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Yes. Anybody ever get that talk? Anybody ever give that talk? Anybody ever give the talk to mor this morning, perhaps? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so why does a parent give that talk? Just shout out. Why would a parent give that talk? Any parent. Yes. I mean business. I got business to do, and you're, you're just along for the ride. There's no business for you. Yes. Come with me. Keep up. That's right. <laughs> All right. Absolutely. Somebody else. I know you're a reflection of them. They want you to, they want you to be them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Don't make us look bad. Don't, Don't make us look bad. bad. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Anything else? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Well, my mother actually was not afraid of, for us to act out. She, she would give us a talk, and, and I tell people, my brother and sister and I learned three-part harmony, by the way, we always answered yes, ma'am, and, and nodded in, in unison. Um, but she wasn't worried about us, because we didn't really do anything bad growing up. We were too scared because of church, being in church too much. In fact, uh, one of my biggest fears was that I'd be in the, my first sexual experience and my whole church would show up right in the middle of it um, with my pants down. And then the praying lady, Ms. Warrington, would start praying real loud. So that image kept us from doing anything until we got to college. Um, so she didn't worry about us. She was not worried. But she was worried about how other people would see us. Does that make sense? So one of the dynamics, and I write about this in the book, is that parents parent according to the fears they have about their children. And so her fear wasn't about us acting out, but how other people would interpret our behavior no matter what we did. 
And in that, in that regards, it's true that on a national stage, when I consult uh, with the National Institute of Health around parenting research, a lot of researchers still haven't gotten the idea that you need to measure parenting stress, for example, very differently because of the fears that parents have very differently. Some people parent according to how can I get my kid home safe from school, and some people don't have to worry about that. Some people have to, to train their kids according to even authority figures as being dangerous to them, and not everybody has to think about that. And so that reality brings a, a whole host of how have we developed research and measurement to capture those experiences, and what if we haven't, right? How do we develop programming around that? So being in the supermarket was some, very stressful for us. We could see as children the looks that other people would have on our mother or on us, and it bothered us. You ever go someplace where you're the stranger, you're the one that everybody looks at and questions why you are there? So as children, the stress being high, we would dis try to distract our mother from that. So the idea was if she didn't see the looks, there would be no drama. Right? And if we could distract her, we would do our best, but we couldn't act out. That was not a possibility. So we counted up, we tried counting up all the food in the shopping cart. Because if we did that and we're accurate, she would say, oh, how bright her children were. She'd be focused on us. She would even see the looks of the other people, get our food, go home, great day. Some days that worked. Some days that didn't work. And the only thing we had left was what our father taught us, which was to pray. And we'd say, please, Lord, don't let nothing happen in the supermarket today. Some days that worked. Some days God was busy with some other kids, maybe in another supermarket in another town, you know, child logic and all. Um, and other days nothing worked, and you could feel the tension. You could cut it with a knife. And you could feel it crescendo as we get up to the conveyor belt, at which point the person behind the counter would have to do something. And I write about this as a sort of racial Tourette, as a way in which my mother's style was offensive to other people, and they could not contain their anxiety, right? And they had to do something or say something to put my mother in her place. And the worst thing they could do was to say, was to throw her food into the bag, right? And that, at that point, it was on. Have you ever been cursed out? Anybody here been cursed out? <laughs> you have children, you haven't been cursed out? No, <laughs> young children, I guess, maybe. What's it feel like if you get cursed out? Humiliating. Humiliating. Embarrassing. Mm-hmm. Embarrassing. Threatening. Threatening. Yes. Absolutely. Um, very intense. And my mother would be very good at it in about 25 seconds. It wouldn't take long. The person would be cut up in little pieces on the floor, writhing in utter pain and decay. Um, and the thing I didn't tell you is both my parents were Christian. The difference is my father prayed before the conflict and my mother prayed after. <laughs> and if you listen to my um, brother talk sometime, he'll talk about these sort of notions. Uh, he was just on Oprah. I don't know if any of you watch Oprah. Probably nobody. Uh, so she had <laughs> Super Soul Sunday and he was on and talking about uh, issues of spirituality. But for us, learning the lesson of my father and mother was that sometimes you have to pray, you have to ponder, you have to think through racial conflict. And other days you have to push, you have to speak up, you have to say something. And the argument I'm trying to make is that we live in a country that doesn't talk about race, which means we're not very literate. We're not very literate at how we ponder and process and think through. And we're not very literate about how we speak up. We're scared to speak. And rather than take a sort of blaming focus on that, which is ideological, characterological. What kind of person are you that you can't do these things? Or what kind of person are you that you say uh, these things? I would rather take a, a position of stress that people are overwhelmed and do not know what to do, right? And, in, and, and unfortunately, regardless of intentionality, outcomes that occur are still quite detrimental to our health, to our children's health, and that we can do something about it, we can say something about it, um, and it starts with story, it starts with telling a story. So having said that, let me ask you, um, and this is what we would do with anybody in our work, we'd ask you to think about, um, do you remember any stories you heard uh, about racial, how to navigate racial matters while you were growing up? Or 
Did any of my story trigger memories in your own head, thoughts, reactions? What I'd like for you to do is just turn to one person next to you and talk to that person about your story or a reaction to my story. And then I'm going to try to tell you why I think uh, this is more important when it comes to race relations than anything else. So think of a story while you were growing up, any age, pick any age. Did you hear any messages about race growing up? And if so, what were they? Or just a reaction to my story. You have two minutes, right? And talk to your partner, and then I'm going to say switch, and then your partner will share with you. Okay. So uh, as part of the set of skills, uh, thinking about racial literacy, thinking about what kind of skills are necessary, one of those skills is how well can I notice myself in an interaction? So let's say if I only have 60 seconds, doesn't it make sense that I'm aware of what's going on with me in those 60 seconds in order to make better decisions and choices? And part of the idea here is um, in learning how to do that, I'm going to ask you to calculate, locate, and communicate. Calculate is on a scale of 1 to 10, what, what feeling am I having now and how intense is it? 10 being the most intense, 1 being not intense at all. Locate it, where in my body do I feel it? And um, third, communicate it. To what degree do, am I aware of the self-talk that goes on during the experience? Now, the high schoolers were very good, I thought, at, at, at accessing not only what intensity level uh, they were uh, at, but also where in their body do they feel it. And some were more uh, descriptive than others. And I think the more descriptive and specific, the better you're able to manage a particular stressful moment. And also, don't forget to breathe and exhale. I always forget that part. <laughs> and uh, so before we ask you about your story, can you tell me a little bit, did you notice anything about yourself while you were telling the story to your partner? Now, do you think, uh, do you, can you see how what I'm thinking about something, how I'm thinking about myself when I have a racial encounter is very important, how that encounter comes out? Does that make sense? That if you're worrying about how you'll come across, if you're worried about what people are thinking of me in this moment, uh, should I say this thing, should I not say this thing? Um, um, I really believe this is the battleground of race relations that we haven't addressed, right? Because the way in which we actually get to the place of saying something or doing something is really um, far beyond what's going on with us in, the, in that process. And that's where I find it courageous um, for people to, to talk about what's going on with me right now. And um, the fears that drive our, our engagements oftentimes um, are, are, unearth are not unearthed. In, they're unearthed in a way, and I, and I think having to get at them. And this is one way to do it. So I'm going to ask you to think about that in a sense. So can anybody share a story, if you feel so inclined, that you might have gotten from family? And this was the, the original attempt to ask you what were some of the messages about race and difference while growing up. But I understand not everybody has them. You know, my grandfather walked with Martin Luther King. That was one comment I got. I said, that's very interesting. Um, did you walk with Martin Luther King? And part of the idea was, how does that affect you and your decision making around these moments? So I find what you shared much more courageous than our attachment to a civil rights history because I'm not sure that trickles down to a face-to-face -face encounter. Maybe it does. Maybe having voted for Obama, or maybe having made some larger statement and philanthropic sort of effort, that's going to change how I negotiate a face-to-face -face encounter. I think sharing the challenges of doing that, much more courageous, because that allows for a building block of how do I manage my emotion when I want to speak up against something or speak up for something. Um, so I, I find dealing with the fear a much more courageous act. And I think um, because it's directly related to how I speak, what I feel, what I want to do in a very short period of time. Um, the question is, what's the goal, right? So I think um, part of the goal for me and why I think of racial empowerment as, as a goal in and of itself is that a lot of times, um, from our research, parents don't always talk to their kids about race, regardless of the racial background. They usually wait until something tragic happens, right? So one counter to that is that 
if we talked about it more all the time, we could add all kinds of commentary around it being both positive um, and, and dealing with, and thinking about it positively, not just negatively. And I could argue that every family could do that, even if they had different experiences. But I would also argue, let's say, you don't have to talk to your child about this because the dangers in your locale are not the same as the dangers for me in the same locale. That doesn't mean that talking about it would, would mean you couldn't understand where I was coming from. Now, I think there are times we try to share this with people and they're not ready to hear it. In that, in that case, I think you have to make judgments. Is it safe for me to really share what's going on, my feelings in this context? When we were talking to young people today and then in the work that we've done with African-American boys in Philly, we teach a course about how important it is to share your feelings, right? But we have another course on how not to, to curse out cops, right? <laughs> because when you're being harassed every day on a street corner just by standing and doing nothing, right? First, we had to teach them that doesn't happen to all youth. They didn't really get that because they thought this is what police do. They've never been out of their neighborhoods. They don't get but then uh, the idea of what you feel rage in those motions, that, that it's OK to curse out the cop, but not in front of the cop. So there are ways in which um, someone could, could, I think, essentially get that maybe I haven't had that experience, but maybe I could, I could feel some kind of sadness that you have to go through that. And we also get that from stories uh, of young people who vicariously watch their friends of color go through stuff that they don't go through. And we're still in the same car. We're getting stopped by the same cop. And there's a way in which I see viscerally that that was not the way I was treated. We see this in classrooms and the like. So I get that maybe they might not understand it, whoever they are. But that would not be a reason not to talk about it more deeply. And um, I actually think other kids can hold other kids accountable for what they don't know or see. So I, I agree with you. The fear isn't the same. But um, the idea is, can I get to a place of skill uh, where I can speak that if I choose to speak it in front of anybody? And I think we could also say, educationally, it's an imperative that we ch challenge images for any group that might fuel the decision making that folks have in 60 seconds or less. Mm -hmm. I don't need to feel like all the cops that shot these young people over the last couple of years were bigots to understand what's going on. But I think I do need to understand, what do you, how do you do good police work when you're really stressed, when you only have 10, 15, 20 seconds to make a decision? And I think media images are more likely to be influential on you in those moments. Oh than an ideological uh, statement about what I believe, right? Or who I have voted for in a sense. And so absolutely, we could argue um, uh, around media influencing short-term decisions. In, the, in, in some of the universities, the idea was in the 70s, 80s, that if you could actually have people together in the same spot who were different, the goal was that we could change attitudes. And so universities would often put folks together, roommates, who were from very different backgrounds. And, and the funny thing is, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Uh, but one argument about being in a diverse environment that I think is a challenge is that sometimes it increases stereotype because we don't address the fears that people have. So I could be around you. and we might hope that me being around you would get to know and reduce my sense that you're a threat. But if I don't have some kind of feedback to deal with my fear, it could actually increase, right? So I could, the, the closer I get to you, the more scared I get. And I think the argument could be made on any issue. And I would say, what kind of instruction could mediate that experience of fear? And I would say, if we're not addressing fear, can we actually be addressing stereotypes? And I, I, don't, I don't agree. And I think the more explicit you talk about, about these issues, the better you are than hope and praying that they get it, right? Hope and praying that we would somehow, uh, by being in a diverse environment, you know, not get it. And you could argue that, well, some, we try to get more diversity, but we can't always bring ourselves to a certain, what's the level of diversity that brings about the best optimal sense of learning? And that is a, a particular issue. Let me just share a couple of things. The theory is here is that, 
recast theory is that racial socialization can reduce the stress of coping during racial conflicts by improving one's racial self-efficacy. So the ability to talk to young people about um, racial matters is socialization. And we think there are some elements in it that tend to work better than others. Are there messages around affection? So if I was going to address stereotype, could I be giving messages around what's positive about you, not just what other people are saying that's negative about you? Right? So it includes affection, protection, and correction. Um, but the reason we do socialization is you're trying to reduce the stress of coping. That when I get in that moment that I feel overwhelmed, how am I going to respond? And I would argue that avoidance is the top coping response when it comes to racial matters. It doesn't make it wrong or right. I just think it makes it ineffective. That we're less likely. It reduces stress in the moment, but it doesn't prepare you for future moments that might occur. And when we talk to young people in schools, they often say, you know, yeah, I can get to the point where I see the elephant in the room, but I don't know what to do once I see it. I can get when somebody's dismissing me in this moment, what we think of as microaggressions, these sort of subtle slights, and I can't really figure out did they mean it or did they not mean it. But even if I do figure it out, I'm not sure what do I do next. I'm not sure what I do with this thing that's bothering me, right? And um, part of the idea is I have to manage my stress to get to a place of racial self-efficacy, which is confidence. How confident do I feel that when someone hits me with an insult, I can come back with something that isn't an underreaction, which is minimizing the stress that I've gone through, or an overreaction, which is missing the boat is exactly what I really want to say and going overboard but somewhere in the middle. And I would just argue that it takes practice. And you're saying practice? We're talking about practice? Yes, we're talking about practice. <laughs> Being from Philly, I had to throw that in for those other people. So some issues are why is it important to reduce racial stress? Well, some of the neuroscience research on this is suggesting that the fear is so visceral that the fear of responses that people are making, in this case in response to black males, is so ingrained in their consciousness that people respond as if they're responding to spiders and snakes. So that if I only have a second to respond, how, do, how is it that I respond to, to, to boys of color very differently than I do to other groups, right? And that's regardless of my, racial, my sort of ideological place. Claude Steele talks about this in the Viv, uh, uh, Whistling Vivaldi as a racing mind, one that's so focused on some tasks but ignoring others. It sort of keeps us... Um, sort of our brains are working overtime. It's also a reason why people hate diversity workshops, because they get physically tired, because <laughs> they're busy trying to prove I'm not racist or that I am OK. And more, all that energy is spent on self-preservation, um, and it's very draining in the process, a racing mind. If I ask you now, which grade do you think students of all uh, racial groups are most likely to be expelled the most, how many of you would say lower school? How many of you would say middle school? How many of you would say high school? Or, yeah. Now, we don't have time to ask your psychological reason for your answer, uh, but I have put this on, a, um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, a midterm exam, by the way. The answer is pre-K. Wow. And if you, if you look at the work that uh, Dr. Gilliam has done at the Yale Child Study Center, he's, he points out that uh, pre-K students are expelled 3.2 times the rate of K through 12 students, right? And you're saying, how could they get rid of those poor little pre-K? They're so cute and cuddly, until you have one of your own, perhaps, maybe. <laughs> and then you say, I understand. But, uh, but the point I want to say to you is, really, there's still racial disproportionality at the pre-K level. Department of Education just came out with some more data to support this. Uh, and that African-American preschoolers are still being uh, expelled, even though at greater rates even though we have no data that they misbehaved in, uh, more than other groups. Now, Gilliam's uh, understanding of this uh, is not about uh, bad teachers, uh, but he is making us think that the authority figures are having overreactions. And these overreactions, I think, doesn't make them bad, but I think it's related to being overstressed, being overwhelmed in a moment. That something happens when Jamal is acting out. And I don't think they have to be bigoted. I don't think they have to be uh, bad teachers. I just think they have to be scared. And fear alone could account for these issues. The other point he makes is that when you have a behavioral consultant in the room, the disparity goes away. And one of the arguments is why would a behavioral consultant make a difference 
And I think it's about feedback, supporting teachers and the stresses that they might go through. But it's also by giving developmental knowledge to educators and authority figures to explain that these behaviors are well within a developmental spectrum. Now, Philip Goff's work out of UCLA has been quite prominent in the sense um, when he's looked at um, black boys compared to white boys at the age of 10, when he looked at police officers and undergraduate white females. And what he found, pretty much, is that these two groups see black boys as less childlike than their white peers. Um, and in a sense, he calls this thing dehumanization. So it's different than prejudice, it's different than discrimination. It's the idea that when I see you, I change you into something else than human. And at that point, uh, if I do that, he's not claiming that everybody does that, he's saying if I do that, then any behavior that, that, is, uh, that I would ascribe to hum humans, I would not ascribe to you. And that's where you can see some some moments of overreaction. Now, I, I am the father of two children, two boys, a 10-year-old and a 24-year-old. And we're not going to talk about how that happened at all. We don't have time for the distance between them. But I worry about what's going to happen to them all the time. And it doesn't matter what age. They're still babies to me. So, um, and my 10-year-old has a host of comeback lines. He's, he's, he's fairly prepared uh, if someone challenges him. But we talk about... Um, to what degree, when you think about your 10-year-old being thought of, and this is the point Goff is make, making, we give a four-year bump to 10-year-old black boys, as if they're older. And in that sense, it's a dehumanizing process. So probably the biggest crime we could say around racial disproportionality is this notion of dehumanization, that we, we somehow stop seeing you as a boy or as a child, and that any of us could make that, regardless of our racial background. Once we make that decision, then we see a lot of, I think, these disproportionalities. Now, there's other research on this which we don't have time to go into. Even when we look at the play of preschoolers, there are diversities around racial disproportionality. Now, does that cause us to blame? I don't think so. But I think it does cause us to hold accountable that when we are fearful in these moments, and fear is something we can deal with, stress is absolutely something we can deal with. Um, changing systemic racism, if you think that's something you have to deal with, you're going to go to bed every night a little depressed. I didn't change systemic racism today, right? But stress is much more doable. Fear, I can see in other people. I can feel it. Young people can learn. We can teach fifth and sixth graders to calculate, locate, and communicate. They can know what's going on in their bodies. They can see when somebody doesn't like them. And they can respond with comeback lines that are not overreactions or underreactions to the moment. Well, there's no, there's not a lot, there's no data suggesting that they act differently than any other group. The, the issue is, um, uh, and we're actually looking at racial stress as a measure separate from teaching stress. So you could look at early teachers, TFA teachers in particular, who are new to teaching. Is that more important, being new to teaching, than teaching black and brown kids, right? Those are, to me, they're different dimensions, but we're trying to demonstrate that. So we have a measure of racial stress, and in one study we found that being stressed about learning how to be a teacher is a very different construct than being stressed to learn how to teach in front of black and brown kids. Because my issues around race um, come up and interfere with how I think about teaching. And I think some can get over that. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a death knell, but, um, Learning how to be a good teacher is very different. And in a lot of teaching schools, including ours, we've had to shift. So we're focusing on how to be like the best social studies teacher, the best math teacher, right? But we've had no skills in how do I navigate the relational dynamics between me and Jamal, where I'm frightened about Jamal's style. Now, maybe Jamal is behaving the same as other kids, but he's got a little swag to it, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And I think even when you take that position, you also don't want to take a blame position, although it, it's sometimes natural 
that when I'm stressed and overwhelmed and don't know what to do, uh, which is something as educators we should know that people who don't know what to do, we can help with that. But it requires ability to say, I'm a little scared at this moment. That's why sharing that I, I'm sharing something difficult is an incredible precursor before learning some very difficult or, or not so difficult knowledge. I'm struggling here. So in our measure, we find that some teachers are very much saying, I'm scared in these racially diverse classrooms. But I also go ask for help. And there's some who say, I'm really scared. But I don't want anybody to see that I'm scared, because then they'll think I'm racist. right? But they don't learn the skills in navigating in these moments. And I think those are different realities. There's nothing wrong with being scared, absolutely. And to think of it as racist is, is blaming. But what you do with that fear is, is really important. Mm hmm absolutely. But our, my, again, my argument is then, can we create um, some kind of community that allows kids to talk about that? And I honestly go to places with people I've never seen and will never see again. I may never see you again. I may only have 10 minutes, but it's amazing what children will tell me about those times. And why? Because we ask. Sometimes we don't ask about what's it like for you being different. Have you had any experiences where somebody might have treated you differently as a function of your race? It doesn't mean that they're a bad person. I just want to know, have you had an experience? And the questions are, does it still bother you? Do you still think about it? Does it influence who you're friends with? Does it influence how confident you feel in math and social studies and history? Do you ever find yourself choosing to avoid people because of, of that. These are the, the things that affect learning, motivation, performance, other than student-teacher relationships, which is important. How close am I to teachers? Some of the young boys tell us there are teachers that we even like who keep distance from us. And they talked about in this one school uh, teachers who they really like, they call them fleas. So well, why do you call them fleas? Say because they bother us to get our work done. So they have made distinctions between teachers who cared enough about them to harass them about getting their work done. Whereas everybody else was nice, but they kept distance. They never said anything. They never shared anything. They might have been fearful. So I'm saying, if we ask, you can get those first, second, third, fourth. And um, I think we can get it from teachers as well. But you have to have a culture that's really open to seeing this as trauma over time. Parents can do a lot, too, around how is this affecting sleeping habits? You know, what are kids saying about these issues? Now, a lot of people ask me, if you talk about race, isn't that causing most of the problem? Isn't that also contributing to the drama? Well, I do think uh, some of the challenges, some people might think, well, this is no big deal because I don't see how it's effective to anybody. So sometimes I drop knowledge around, uh, do we understand the impact of racism in our society? Most people do not. They think of it as an ideological stance. They don't think of it as something where somebody's physiology is being changed or that they're stressed by it. It's affecting eating habits, affecting sleep. We also know racism over the course of life affects length of stay on this planet, right? But most people don't know that. But I think I can teach young people about how stress affects their bodies. How much they appreciate what's going on in their bodies is very much related to how much they believe positively about themselves. So there's knowledge that needs to be dropped in that arena. But secondly, there's the issue of counter arguments. So people will say, you know, if you bring up negative stuff, it'll, it'll make kids negative. And I'm afraid I'm going to scare my kids to death. I don't want to do that. I love them. But uh, then I remind people, say, well, one of the few privileges of parenting is having the ability to scare your children at certain points in time because there are very few uh, opportunities we get. So we'll, we'll scare our kids about many things that we think are necessary that I would argue are very rare. So we scare them about not taking candy from strangers. Don't talk to strangers, right? And don't talk to strangers with candy, whatever, you know? 
So I asked a group of kids, you know, at a school, I said, do your parents ever say anything to you that you know they really are serious about? He says, yeah, don't talk to strangers and don't talk to strangers with candy. I said, well, have you ever run into any strangers with candy? No, never happened. <laughs> but we're real prepared for it, is what they said. <laughs> so I say to parents, you know, the counter argument to, well, why wouldn't you want to talk about race if you thought that was a danger to not have the skills to navigate these emotional conflicts and face-to-face -face scenarios, which are going to happen a lot more frequently than run into strangers with candy, right? The, the, the sort of airplane uh, message about what should you do in case of emergency, I bet if I quiz you all right now, you could probably get 50% of the words right, but you get the concepts right probably 100%. And that's without practice, right? But, but you learning that message, and some of us turn off to the message as soon as it comes on. We know it so well, right? But it doesn't cause a plane crash because you get that message. And so we say the same thing to people talking about race. So you have to do counter-argument, I think, and prepare people for the counter-argument that somehow bringing up race is racist in and of itself. Um, and, I, and I think stress and skills base says do, wouldn't you want your child to be able to navigate a stressful moment about his or her difference, regardless of it, uh, and come away whole as if he or she felt like they didn't have to swallow that, they could see that was his problem, not mine. They could navigate it in the same way that we problem solve other issues. So those are the two areas that I think of. And in the book that I've written about it, I've tried to make the case that, um, not only f uh, across, uh, not for, for adults, but also for children um, thinking of even uh, from fifth grade on. Well, I think it, um, there, the question is what knowledge stream do you want to go into? Do you want to go into education? Do you want to go into uh, incarceration rates? Do you want to go into arrest rates? in terms of disproportionality across race. You could even look at income and class and still see that class alone is not explained this racial disproportionality. So it, it depends on how much knowledge we need to get in certain areas. But um, I think there's still the issue, even if you have facts, teaching our children um, how to speak up when they feel overpowered emotionally is still very important. And I think that still takes practice. Um, we were in a school, um, I told today, with uh, um, a very high academic school in South Jersey in which um, the students asked us to come and teach them about racial literacy. It's all black class. And they, I asked them, what would you do if somebody called you the N-word, right? And all of them said we'd kick their behinds, right? That was the number one answer to everything. And except the football player, who was the biggest guy in the room, who said, Nothing. So I asked him, so what would you do? He said, well, it would never happen. It never happened to me. <laughs> and everybody in the room said, yeah, it never happened to me. <laughs> um, so I said, humor me. I know I, I'm stupid, so you tell me, what would you do if, in fact, it happened? He said, of course I would kick his behind, right? <laughs> so it so happened, a week goes by, and that's the first class. Before the second class, it so happens, he luckily got called the N-word by a friend, actually. Um, and the kids who were in the class who were afraid of him came to us in the parking lot and they came up and they said, he got called the N-word. <laughs> and they were whispering. And then they came back, don't tell him I told you, right? Because they're really scared. And I like to mess with people. So I go up to him and I said, so um, I heard you got called the N-word. What did you do? Did you kick their behinds? He said, no. He said, I got paralyzed. And I said, that's great because that's what trauma is something that you did not expect to happen, right? And you were unprepared for it. So the more we kept talking, though, he kept getting angrier that he hadn't kicked his behind. And he kept wanting to go back, and he voiced that. And so we began to tell him about how systems were prepared for him to do that, right? So that you, you can do a socialization around how your anger means something different, particularly because you're the biggest guy in the room and because you're black, and we, have to, we spend time teaching them about that. So there are ways in which you're never going to out-argue certain folks around Obama, no more racism. But you're still going to have to prepare them for the skills of managing their emotions in these moments in which they shouldn't underreact, pretend it didn't happen, 
and shouldn't overreact when it kick everybody's behind, right? And I think those are the kind of skills that we're talking about. Um, and sometimes I think young people get very gifted over time in the comeback lines we get about how to disarm somebody, right? About, I don't appreciate the way you're treating me in this moment, right? And that's what we want for all kids to be able to say. Boys, girls, doesn't matter. Um, and that's the, that's the level in which we're talking about. Um, but over time, you get better at, at defending these arguments. Um, but they won't come if you don't have a sort of emotional center where you feel confident about who you are, confident about your racial sense of who you are. Um, and I think that's where the practice comes in. Now, we came up with a, a list of the top 10 things to say when somebody calls you the N-word, right? And we had to practice some unhealthy comeback lines before they could come up with some healthy comeback lines. <laughs> and I write about this in the book. And so, um, so there, there's a host of them we could talk about. But over time, kids borrow each other's comeback lines. And they're able to use them. And when you're really overwhelmed and you don't know anything to say, you say, excuse me? And then you wait, and hopefully something better comes up <laughs> so when you can say it. But it's the, it's the agency to be able to say, I reject your rejection of me. Doesn't matter what you say, but I don't really appreciate your rejection of me. And I think um, we haven't got very facile, even as adults, I think, sometimes to say that. Yeah, I think uh, in front of the work that we've been doing in independent schools, the kids would tell us, um, for example, th they might shift their behavior depending on how they think the different audiences in which they must live are going to perceive them. So in, um, in Philadelphia, there was a school that used to be just across 50, uh, City Avenue. So you're in Montgomery County if you cross the street, and on the other side is Philadelphia. So some lived in Philly, and they were going to the private school across the street. So literally, as they leave the school, they come out the back door because they don't want to go, they don't want anybody seeing them. They're getting on a SEPTA bus because everybody else has cars, Mercedes rolling around and around the front where their kids are getting picked up. So they're hiding from some of their kids uh, who are friends at the school. And on their way to the bus stop, they're changing their clothes back to garb they can wear in the city. So that's a form of code switching. The problem is, is it stressful for you to code switch? And are you accounting for the level of stress it is to be in both worlds? And I think some young people literally can manage the stress of it. It's not a thing. It's no big deal. But others find it incredibly stressful. And that's where you want parents and teachers to intervene. I want to know what is your world when you come to school, right? Or when you go back home. Um, and you can account for travel distance as well as another issue, but I think, um, I would make the same argument for parents who are going to racially socialize their kids. How stressful is it for you? Do you need some more support and time yourself before you can talk to your kids about this stuff? Because there are memories kicking up for you about your childhood that are also interfering. Uh, some people can do it well and some, some can't because the stress of it is so overwhelming. So that would be the only issue. Code switching is a wonderful set of skills, but not if you're feeling like you're losing pieces of yourself every time you do it. And uh, we know some kids who just say, I'm tired of that, you know? I'm not going to, I'm tired of having to bend. And I, I understand that, I, and I appreciate the reality. And the last part is, one of the arguments for affinity groups is so that you support students who are different, who can talk about those things without being condemned, without being thought of as being self-segregation which is a legal term, it's a, mis it's a misunderstanding. You don't use the word segregation, in my view, without it being a legal forcing. It's a legal term about people who are forced to be in certain places. Just because I choose to be with somebody like me is not segregation. It's not legally uh, enforced. Yes? Sorry, what's an affinity group? Okay, good question. Um, affinity group is, um, uh, thought of in certain schools as, as groups of students from the same background deciding to group together. So African American and Black Student League or Gay and Lesbian Alliance in certain schools because we have interests that are specific to our particular uh, challenges or triumphs and needs in the school and meeting together to talk about those issues, put on events, make the school aware um, is a way that we cope 
through the school and, and navigate it uh, much more effectively. And some schools are more positively in favor of those dynamics and some are not. And you can see it not only at the student level but also at parent and teacher level. It's absolutely, absolutely essential. But I would, say, I would still say it has to be mediated by the teacher's own sense of stress. So that it's very hard for me to hear what you're going through if, myself, if I myself am scared. Um, so I was at Sidwell, and, and uh, one of the challenges is, was um, in lower school, the parents of low, black parents in lower school were complaining that when we get reports back from the teachers, there are these long reports, but we don't really understand whether our children are doing better or not. <laughs> so I go to the teachers and I say to the teachers, like, the parents aren't getting what you're trying to say in these long worded reports. They're very flowing, very elaborate. But they want to know, can my, can my child read? Can he spell? <laughs> can he do math? You know, I want to know. And I'm talking to the teachers and, and some of them start to admit that I'm a little worried if I get too specific that I'll be perceived as racist. Now, I, don't, I think that's a very real fear. And wherever I go, once people tell me, I think that's a reality. So um, what I'm saying to you, do you realize that you're contributing to a larger distrust of you? Because you're not really telling the truth, or at least in someone's eyes, a certain amount of truth about what is the issue. And I have had untold families say, everything was going fine until they told me, now my son needs a therapist to get through a moment. But I had nothing up to this point to let me know that something was wrong enough to do, have to do that. So I think um, part of the issue is mediated through the teacher's sense of fear. So even if I have knowledge about the different groups in the world, that's not enough if my own fear about how I'm going to be perceived in these moments. And that's why I think it's courageous to say, I'm struggling here, and I need some support or help. Um, to me, that's how you address that fear. And then, I can tolerate and I can hear more, I have more room to breathe and listen to um, how other people struggle. But my struggle still is, is ma it matters. And I think without blame, I think without blame is essential for that to occur. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think if, if you take the stress analysis, w one of the things about fear um, is that it clogs your mind. So um, fear is the mind killer. But what often happens for all of us when we're stressed, we lose peripheral vision and hearing. So we don't see things for our left or right. And we're trying to protect what's in front of us. And I think cops go through this as well. That the threat responses you see from cops, to me, are the most dangerous things. Uh, and, and why you would need to shift training, you need to shift training by putting them in situations in which um, they are utterly fearful and how to reduce their fear in those moments. I think they're more dangerous to themselves as well, not just to others when you're threatened. So um, breathe and exhale is a strategy that helps bring oxygen to your brain so that you can get back your peripheral vision and hearing. And what we see in encounters with, with black youth is sometimes the bravado that's just happening is a way to connect. It's not a way to reject, right? So that sometimes attitude people will interpret and misinterpret as a threat, when in fact it's, it's, it's a way of connection, a way of bonding. And we've had teachers tell us where they really misread what students were saying to them, right? And they liked this teacher. They liked the teacher. Uh, and I have an example of that. But... Um, so Ali Michael and, and some others are starting to write about white racial socialization. And part of the argument is, is that um, in the interviews that they've done, the, the best response for the white parents to their teenage children in those studies were uh, that the less talking about it, the more competent they thought their kids were. Right? And so by bringing this stuff up, because it caused other, could cause all kinds of fear in other people, some of, uh, out of an altruistic sort of place, we don't want to bring harm to anyone else, minimize the amount of conversation. Ironically, this, the teenagers would often bring up issues to the, to the parents that upset the parents in ways, um, but they always felt great if their kids um, didn't have negative bad attitudes around race, 
but it wasn't about how to promote positive interactions. So that's back to ideology. Are my kids you know, this kind of person or that kind of person as opposed to skills? Do they know how to navigate racial stress right in the moment? And I would say, I would go back to the argument that if all parents had to worry about how their children were perceived in a, in a racialized world, they might start socializing. If you think about what we think about girls, right? If you think about early mature boys and girls, some of us who've had to deal with this as parents, we know that early mature girls and boys experience the world very differently. Girls are hit on by older men, right? And if you could, if you could be with your children 24 hours, seven hours a day, you would just hold them and not let anybody talk to them probably. But you, you can't account for a 10-year-old looking like a 14-year-old or a 12-year-old looking like an 18-year-old and how the world will see them. And so you might think about talking to them very differently. And I would say if white parents were thinking about the world in racialized lenses, they would say, in order to prepare my child about how he or she will be perceived, and there could be stereotypes about cluelessness about race, you know, always going to be wealthy or whatever, I would argue that the stress would kick in enough for us to say, maybe I should bring this up. I mean, and the untold students who've told me um, I'm driving with my black friend and they get stopped or they got harassed and I didn't. And they have to live with being vicariously stressed by s witnessing that and not knowing what to have s said or, do or done in those scenarios. You still have the same, I believe, outcomes of, of sleep disturbance, worrying about, I wish I had a do-over. If I had another second chance, I would have said this. Um, and the whole comeback line process is preparing people. If you had a do-over, what would you say the next time? That would be not an underreaction or overreaction. And I think you could definitely say that for white students. Um, and we're only talking about race. We're not talking about other issues of rejection. So you could figure other diversity issues could be thrown in as to why you would want to socialize. Well, I have a, I taped a conversation I had with my, my youngest son when he was eight. And part of it, um, and I'm crazy, so my mother was crazy too, and so I, we start early, that's all I would say. And I think if you knew the dangers in preschool were happening, you would start in preschool, right? Because kids know when somebody doesn't like them. And it doesn't mean they're a bad teacher, it just kids can pick up on those little things. Now, we're more inclined as adults to not think that that's racial because we think race is bad or somebody who's thinking that way with my kid who's, who's black is bad or, or of color instead of thinking about it as somebody overwhelmed and stressed. When my son was, um, Michelle Fine is a wonderful researcher, if you ever get a chance to read her work. A uh, white woman has studied racial stuff and gender stuff for years. She's brilliant. She had a son named Sam. She said, when, and, and Julie, my oldest son, Brian, was like uh, four at the time. He said, when, when, when Brian gets a couple years older, you need to take him to this class, Teacher Pierre. I love Teacher Pierre. Teacher Pierre had a classroom that in one corner was the Mojave Desert. Over here was the Kilimanjaro. Here was some, some other tropical forest. And whenever he taught, he took the kids to different parts of the world. And it was just flowing and open. So I, I put my child and my wife at the time, and I put my son in, in, the, in the class. And everything was fine until um, there was a disagreement. So when Teacher Pierre said to Susan, Susan, don't you think it's time now for you to go into the corner? Susan got up, went over to the corner. When he came to my son, Brian, he said, Brian, don't you think it's time now for you to go in the corner? Brian said, no. Right? So over time, we didn't know this, but Brian came home and said, the teacher doesn't like me. So we went and we watched this whole thing happen, not only to Brian, but to other kids. So I said, we got this. So we told teacher prayer, look, if you want my son to go over in the corner, you said, boy, get your behind over in the corner and go there now. He will go, I promise you. <laughs> and you need to say, I love you as you go, because some people think you tell him to get, over, get his behind it doesn't mean love. Anyway, my point is, he was four, four or five. 
Now, over time, the teacher could not tolerate his own sensibilities, did not see that he needed to transact culturally different for some of the kids in the classroom. Now, was he a bad teacher? No, he was a beautiful teacher, but he could not navigate these moments. And my son took it as a personal dig, and so did the other kids of color in that classroom. I don't need to blame him, right, to see that there's a problem going on that I think eventually would hurt Brian, and so we took him out of school, right? And I would just argue that those are things we don't think of as racial, but they are, and I think young people can t be taught very early. Uh, when Brian was four, he said, Dad, how come there are no black Santa Clauses on TV? I said, that's beautiful. You know, I just said, that's beautiful. I didn't answer it, but I said, that's beautiful. Because if you can see the elephants in the room, to me, to some degree, you can do something about it. And children are beautiful in the sense that they haven't learned to not see what they see as we have. So, yeah, I would, I would start early. Um, the only other thing I would say, when my son was eight, and even though I've done this for, for several decades, I found myself very awkwardly overwhelmed because um, he was watching CNN uh, right after the George Zimmerman trial, and they were interviewing Trayvon Martin's parents, and they were sad on the television. He could not take his eye off of CNN, and I couldn't get to the television to turn it off quick enough because then he wanted to talk about it. It wasn't prompted by me. It was prompted by him, and when I realized I couldn't get away from it, I taped it, and so part of that conversation is both my awkwardness because he's generating discussion. He has questions in ways that we can't wait to answer, right? We can't say, we'll talk about it later, because he's seeing these two parents sad. He wants to know, why would that happen? And I think in those moments, you realize, um, you know, it's not just what you begin, it's what they begin. Uh, and they might begin earlier than we do. So anyway, there's a, there's a proverb that goes, a lion story will never be known as long as a hunter is the one to tell it. So our job is to make sure all kids get to tell their story the way they want to tell it, um, and us too. So thank you very much.